Well, what a build up. I hope that uh, expectations aren't too heightened by the, the great um, words you've given for me. It's been a real pleasure being part of this, I have to say, and a great pleasure being back again with, with Kent and Victor. Um, it's the third time you've asked me, and I, I had a quick look back, and I remember the first presentation I gave was called Age, Sex and Leadership, on the basis that in those days, you were guaranteed to clear a room if you talked about diversity and women in construction. So I thought if I talked about age and sex, we might get a few people hanging around, and that seemed to work. And then I came back after that, and uh, it was older, bolder, and staying alive. We're getting a bit of a theme here, aren't we? Because now I'm talking about waving, drowning, or keeping afloat. I think it must be something to do with our industry, the industry we all love, which seems to, get, well, it's the economic barometer, isn't it? That's what we always used to say. It goes up and down, depending on what earth's going on in the rest of the world. Now, for you lovely people out there who wonder why on earth they've asked me to come back three times, I'd better give you a little bit of a thumbnail, and I should fess up and say that I'm not a Kentish woman, or a woman of Kent even, but I am an Essex bird, which is pretty close. And one of my favorite bridges, and this is true, and I did a feature on this in Building Magazine, is the Dartford Crossing, which I just think is a joy of engineering when you go zooming over that. And in the old days, when you didn't go on holiday to smart places, um, our holidays, when I was a kid, brought up in, in Westcliff and on sea in Essex, was to take the Royal Sovereign or the Medway Queen, maybe somebody out there can remember these venerable boats, and we used to go for day trips to Margate and Hearn Bay, and we used to buy plastic rubbish on the boat, I seem to remember, and then have candy floss and ice cream, and it was brilliant. And Kent is a very beautiful county and I think what's going to be really interesting are the opportunities and threats facing it in the coming days. Right, what am I going to talk about? Let's go and see what's on the tin as we say. Well I'm going to talk wearing three hats really. One hat is as a non-executive director of a sustainable products company and give some practical examples of how they've been waving, not drowning, and keeping afloat. So there's some sort of direct business examples. I'm then gonna wear my hat, which is boring for Britain on women in the industry. I'm uh, lead on mentoring and I'm public affairs for the Association of Women in Property. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of case studies we generated for the all party parliamentary group on women and work because the other thing we need to do is talk more. I think our industry needs advocates. I think we really do need people out there waving the flag for construction. We really don't do very well at this. We did have a construction minister and we had a chief advisor who spoke at um, KCFG, I remember, um, but they've gone and we're not even listed as part of the task groups that they've set up. So we do need to speak up for our industry. We're an important industry. I'll throw out some bits and bobs on policy and practice and practical tips. And they're really based on having run a business for many years. I'm, I've been an employer. I ran a consultancy business with 14 staff and we, we survived three recessions. What's facing us now is rather different to a recession, but there are lots of common experiences so that's the mixture. And there'll be other bits and pieces thrown in because what always happens when you join in a conference and listen to other people talking rather than doing the helicopter job, you know, arriving, speaking and going off again, is that you hear all these comments other people have made and you think, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that ties in with what I'm going to say. So I'm going to hook back to some of the things that have been said this morning, which really chime, especially on changes in working, um, technology, always learning. Right, let's kick off, because I must, I must try not to let the side down, having seen that wonderful piece of timekeeping just before me. Okay, I'm on the board of EnviroBuild, brilliant startup company, great to be involved in a company where the two young guys who started it up 
decided after a year that they needed a couple of grey beards or grey hairs anyway. So I think really interestingly, they decided to take on two non-execs directors. Um, the other person is a chap who's the money man and I'm the marketing and bonkers ideas woman. And I also help with things like people issues. The reason they started this company is because they, the founder who was a property developer, he'd also worked for Deloitte's um, very sharp businessman, but who is totally committed to sustainability um, and environmental matters, was shocked that when he was doing his developments, he couldn't source sustainable quality products at a reasonable price. And because he couldn't do it, he set up a company to do it. And the other thing that he was rather shocked by was the bad information lack of information, poor information. So he decided to set up the company and he also felt that the really important thing to do was to make it easy to be sustainable, to make making the ethical choice easy without sacrificing value. So he wanted to be a sustainable retailer with a good service and to show his complete commitment to sustainability, they give 10% of their profit every year to the Rainforest Trust. And they have saved thousands and thousands of acres and species of animals. So they put their money where their mouth is. So how have they got on? Here's the products, which they've gradually added to, and they're also doing innovation because I said product development, we've got to keep up. You can see they do cladding. So what was the obvious thing to do? The obvious thing was to research into how to get A-class cladding stay ahead of the game. So it's sustainable, but it also answers questions. So it's decking, it's lumber, it's pedestals, it's paving, it's garden furniture, and they are all sustainable or recyclable. So the aluminium stuff and picking up recycling earlier, that can be recycled. And then there are other benefits in using composites because they actually will release um, good stuff as well as swallowing bad. So everything's looking quite rosy, we're feeling quite chipper, things are looking good. And then of course, we had a bit of a surprise this year. So what happened? Well, as I say, we look pretty good. 2016, sales 1.4 million, and look where we got to in 2019. Grew, got two uh, market streams. And this proved to be the great saver. So 2020 opened full of our good plans and then COVID hit. The real benefit was that we had two sales channels. So I'm talking diversity in this. B to C and B to B. So the company sells to individuals and it also sells to businesses. So we had two channels to follow. One was to get on board with all the major house builders, the major clients, but in parallel, operate a service to somebody who wants to redo their deck or create a balcony. The value of that really came and hit us home in March or April. We had our board meetings every week when COVID first hit because we were so concerned about what the impact would be. And what really struck us was, having decided that B2B was the really big market, B2C, that consumer market, stepped in and kept us afloat. Because all those people who were furloughed or working from home needed a project. So while house building stopped for a while, we had people saying, hey, come on, get out of the house and build that deck. Or... We need some decent garden furniture. So that the beauty of that two-pronged approach came right. The other incredible thing that happened was that the competitors did what a lot of people do in recession, which is they stopped marketing, they stopped advertising. That's what people used to do in recessions. I've done three of them and I'm in marketing. So what happened? I lost a lot of my business, but we kept going. So suddenly there they were in the market with a product people wanted and the competitors had cut right back and we operate online and we had new products ready 
So we were expecting in March and April a bit of a dreary year. And in fact, the turnover forecast is 13 million, 10% EBIT. So that's the first little example about a small startup business that actually found that it survived. So not waving, not drowning. Now I'm going to switch hats. That's my NED hat, sustainable products and the beauty of having two market channels. Now I'm putting on my boring for Britain women in the construction industry bit. And I have to say it's quite funny, really, because for 25 years I've been saying, how come a woman can't work three days a week from home? and then have all the partners and all the managing directors say, oh, no, 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 they have to be in the office. And this won't work. Flexible working. We can't trust them to do it. They'll be defrosting the freezer instead of doing a strategy report. And alleluia, here we are, people working from home. But what we found at Women in Property was a really different approach employers were taking to furlough and flexible working. And because we turn up at Parliament, or we used to, at the all-party parliamentary group, where when we first joined as Women in Property, there was nobody else from the construction industry there. It's run by Jess Phillips, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Jess Phillips. She's not backwards in coming forwards. And we said, we'll give you a couple of examples of the comparison in how businesses are managing furlough. So, to quote Dickens, it's a tale of two women. So here's, it was the best of times story. And this is from Sally, that's not her real name, who's an architect. And she just about sums it up here. The firm was gathered together when this first hit and people were asked what they wanted to do. Those who wanted to go on furlough, those who wanted to stay in the office, those who wanted to stay on site and they worked it out in discussion with real people. And Sally said, well, you know what? I've got a child with special needs. They can't go to school. If I can work from home, that will be great, but I need something else to do. So she undertook a passive house accreditation course. And as she said, it's something she wouldn't have done while she was working at high level on a huge range of architectural practices if it had been normal life. And this picks up something that people were saying earlier. You've got to keep on learning. You keep on learning. Why not make the most of that time? And, and I did learning when I was running a business and two of my kids were doing A-levels and one was gearing up for GCSEs and I decided to do a master's in construction law and arbitration at King's College London because I was involved in a lot of standard contract drafting from the International Federation of Engineers. This was four nights a week, every fortnight with coursework. And <laughs> the first day I turned up and it was one of those moi moments when I, I just thought, I don't know why I'm here. The chap sitting next to me was a civil engineer and a barrister already. And I was just this weird woman who was a builder who was doing this course. And he turned to me at lunchtime and said, they don't appear to have organised anything for us to eat. Would you like to have lunch with me at Middle Temple? Yeah, that sounds good. So we went off to Middle Temple, had a very nice lunch. The next day the phone rang and a chap said, you don't know me, my name's David Smith, but John Doe tells me I need you. And he was running um, a specialist association in the construction industry that had one or two problems. I went in and met them, sorted out their problems, <clears throat> and they were a, con a, a client of mine for 25 years. So I got the feedback for my master's course over lunch on the first day. Oh, and I got my master's as well. But anyway, keep on learning. You've got all these added value. Right. So who was the worst of times? They're the best of times. Here's Amy, she's a surveyor. She was told by email that she was going to be put on furlough. She was told she'd be given two days notice whether she was gonna stay on furlough or come back. This went on for weeks, no contact. So to keep herself occupied, she did two things. She helped three graduates study for their APC 
and she also did her own self-funded arbitration training for which she got no support from the company. Weeks went by. She didn't know whether she was going to be kept on. She didn't know whether she was going to be made redundant. And we talked earlier about stress. She's living on her own in a flat with no company doing virtual training. In the end, she got so fed up, she sent a note round to other people in the organisation, very big organisation, and had three job opportunities within a week. And she feels pretty fed up. So here are two classic examples of how not to do it. And I think the other thing I said earlier, speaking up, speaking up for our industry, letting people tell you their stories. So Fiona, my colleague and I, developed these two case studies, sent off a policy, here's the policy, and this ties in with things that we'll say, we said earlier. And we said that government should recognize those companies who take advantage of furlough to ensure their staff develop their skills. Don't just sit at home, learn something. And why don't you make a package of financial support that is dependent on providing evidence of such activity? So there we were being awkward squad. Now I mentioned recession. I remember with the really bad recession, the first thing I did was sit down and manage my overheads. You have to cut back. And by lunchtime on the first day, I'd saved 2000 pounds because I discovered we were double insured on our office building. And when times are good, you just get stuff in and you trust your broker and you don't look at the stuff. You just think, well, that all seems all right. The figures look about the same. It's amazing what you find when you look and what you cut back. And it's much more important to prune your overheads. Cut what you don't need. Don't be, be careful, be frugal, but don't be seen as mean. The other thing that's really important to do is to revisit your SWOT analysis. For the, I'm sure you all know what SWOT stands for, but it's strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Opportunities and threats are often the same. And the strengths and weaknesses and be honest and do it for yourself as a person as well. What am I really good at? And get somebody else to help you with it. I do a lot of mentoring. And that's another area that's proved to be really important, particularly for those people who are working at home and particularly younger people. I mean, part of the fun of work is going in and mixing with other people. So just keeping in touch and reassuring them and going through saying, well, what have you learned since this all happened? Turn that into a strength, see how you can use it. The other thing to do in these difficult times is make the most of your critical friends. Use your non-execs. Use the people who are interested in you being successful, but aren't watching their back or their fronts. And really importantly, keep everybody informed. Keep them in the loop. You don't have to just be positive. And here's a lunatic fringe slide for you. Five years ago, for all sorts of reasons I won't go into now, I chartered a boat and took 85 people to the Antarctic. And some of them were quite mature, not that I'm a spring chicken. And what suddenly becomes apparent to you is that when you do stuff like this, you are in charge and you need to tell people what's happening. And I also realized there were lots of people who wanted to know what was happening on that boat, but couldn't speak to their relatives or their friends on it. So I did a daily blog and that got a bit hairy actually, cause it's quite bumpy in bits when you're getting to the Antarctic through the Drake Passage. So the boat's doing this, going up and down. And we have a connection by satellite. And the captain said, this is great. If you're going to do a blog, you can do the ship's log as well. So I did a daily blog that we could send by satellite so that everybody knew what we were doing. Do the same with your businesses, because that's one of the ways of staying afloat. So what are the key things? Fleetness of foot, be reactive, be responsive. That value of diversity, have more than one string to your bow, see how you can manipulate other things. Choose what to cut and what to keep. Turn a threat into an opportunity. 
and make the most of technology. Now, I had another slide in here, which I took out and I kicked myself after listening to Guy Holloway talking about the winery because the slide I was going to show was of the wildfires in California wiping out vineyards. And I have a friend with a vineyard and winery in California. And what they're really worried about is the danger of the smoke taint on the grapes. But grapes ripen at different times. So it's all to do with timing as well. So back to that diversity and back to timing and then seeing how you can turn that threat into an opportunity. And make the most of technology. And we've just had an amazing presentation about BIM. There are lots of other things. I mean, we live on Zoom, don't we? How extraordinary is this? I mean, as you can probably tell by the background, I'm not in central London. I'm, I'm in Gloucestershire. And I've been able to operate everything I need to do from there. We have got decent broadband. And if I didn't have that background, nobody would know where I am. Let's seize that, but actually make it work for us. So I'll end with this quote from James Bruton, the young chap who started EnviroBuilt, because I think it really pretty well sums it up. We're fully cloud-based, so remote working was very easy and kept us nimble. We cut costs, they reduced their rent by 50%, and they keep up staff morale with constant communication and regular catch-ups. And I've done it. And everybody sits there with their beer or their Prosecco or their gin, and they know what's going on in the business. And they feel they're doing something worthwhile. They've kept that business going, they're delivering, and they're also making a contribution to the issues that are really important. And their last customer survey report said people were buying their stuff through April, May and June, when we were concerned about the business and they were buying their materials because they had really good information online. They made these tangible contributions to the Rainforest Trust, had a genuine commitment to sustainability and the stuff was good and the garden furniture was comfortable. So it was quality, commitment, fleetness of foot and using technology. And they have staff who are so diverse, many languages, lots of women. And it's great also to see Kent. Look who's running this show today and look who the chief executive is. So a great day. Thank you very much. I'll wrap up there. I've got four minutes to go, three minutes to go for questions, I think. No, a bit more than that. I, oh, that depends whether it's elapsed time or real. <laughs> So that I shall stop amazing. there and I'll be very happy to take any questions anybody has. That is amazing, Sandy. Thank you Thank so, you. so much. I mean, I'm, I'm going to kick off with a question um, because although, I mean, we are massive advocates of women in construction, obviously, but like yourself, I've been in construction over 30 years straight from school and um, I'm quite bored with hearing about women in construction. Yeah. Because it's not about being a woman in construction, it's being a person in construction. And I'm as, I'm as passionate as getting boys into construction mm -hmm. as I am girls into construction. And we're just trying to drive that message um, to the, um, the educators and the influencers to say that the industry is fantastic to go into. Um, and although women in construction is a fantastic cause, I'm not knocking it in the slightest, I don't want to be um, tagged with that really. I like the... Uh, it should be, you know, the, the industry for everyone. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that what has been really interesting on the mental health discussion, we had it earlier, and I talked about it last year as well, is that when the previous piece of research, the current Loughborough research is very interesting, there was some research last year which showed that because of this incredible suicide rate and the, the low mental health in the industry was highly concentrated amongst men. And the things the, the men were saying would make a difference to them were exactly the things that we have, that, that have, people have been using as an excuse for not encouraging women into the industry. I mean, how nonsensical is that? The men were saying, we want decent working conditions. We want somewhere to prepare our food that's not next to the toilets 
in the porter cabin. We want decent, proper food, healthy food. We want water fountains. We want to be recognised for what we do rather than just, oh, well, they're site workers. So all those things that were used as, why would you want your daughter to go into construction? Because it's dirty, dangerous, you're going to be clapped out at 45. They're human issues. You're absolutely right. They're, they're people issues. And when people used to say to me, oh, I think this is terrible. I want, wouldn't want my daughter to work in construction. My answer was, well, why is it okay for your son? It, it has to be a people issue. And I think that's been the most significant change, the recognition that these, the conditions and the respect and the decent working makes it a more attractive industry. Together with, as I said, talking it up, we need storytellers. We need storytellers to say, hey, you know what? It feels really brilliant if you bring that project up off. Um, you get the, the fact, put the mystery back into it put the excitement back into it uh, rather than talking about the things go wrong. So I'm totally with you. We shouldn't be talking about women as and men in construction. We should talk about it being a decent job for everybody. And I think that some of the silver line, if you can say it's a silver lining in COVID, is this realization there is more than one way to do a job. And yeah. you can work from home and you can offer decent conditions and technology should help you. Um, and then it becomes an industry for people. So I quite agree. I'd love not to talk about women in construction anymore. <laughs> and I think as well, during COVID, um, people have realised that the construction industry needs to continue. We couldn't stop to down tools and stop. No. The whole industry had to continue because it's such a massive factor in the rest of the economy. Oh, absolutely. Which is why it's so important to have decent uh, government representation. Yeah. Because the emphasis is on the wrong things at the moment. And, and we need good people talking about the reality of it. And we get, we've already got um, material shortages. Who, who, who listening in the audience there is, is having problems with supplies? Anybody? I think they, yeah. did, they did have earlier, yeah. but now it's sort of, um, it's moving on a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was, um... And that's not going to, well, that needs to be managed. But it might help with some of the local suppliers. Again, when Guy Holloway was talking, I think it's really important to recognise the value of um, of local uh, local suppliers and local yeah. networks yeah. and chains, um, which absolutely. I think make a lot and of that's difference. Quite, that's absolutely key to um, the Kent Construction Focus Group, which is part of the chain, Kent, Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce. That's exactly why the group was formed to keep um, local business doing business with each other as such and, and delivering on local projects really so and that just remains so strong now so many years on so and it'll always be incredibly important mm. so yeah that's a huge message I think to take from today and why we have to keep groups like the Ken Construction Focus Group um, moving forwards and keep them strong. Yeah. Have you found have, have you found that local networks just to help communities survive has made a difference. I mean, I'm very struck here um, in Gloucestershire, where I'm at the moment, um, there were networks set up immediately with uh, local farmers delivering and people, people who didn't have transport setting up virtual networks and WhatsApp groups to help deliver supplies and pick up medicines. Has that been true? in Kent have you got local community networks? Yeah, individual villages have been doing those kind of things really and I know other other groups have been doing that as well yes. Does anybody know? The online about... community has been amazing as well to keep everybody going in that sort of mental health capacity as well and keeping everyone engaged and talking. Yeah does anybody know about Jam the music on the Romney Marsh festival? Oh. Yes I live yeah. on Romney Marsh <laughs> oh right, right. Because I'm 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 a trustee of an orchestra, which is a great joy. Makes a change from cement, and but there's lots of transferable skills, and they've used technology as well because musicians can't play. You know they have no audience, and the concert halls have shut. Mm. Uh, but the jam on the marsh was using churches with limited groups. But now what the orchestra is doing um, is live streaming concerts with pay to view. Because um, that was a challenge if people are so used to downloading for free, but that's no good to an orchestra and musicians who need to survive. So they have now a season ticket. You buy, you buy a season ticket and you get to hear eight concerts. So it's, 
just these and they're using unusual venues i was hoping we could get them into a new partly built construction site because i think the acoustic would be brilliant well so. let us know sandy because obviously we everybody in kent knows us obviously so if of we course. can help in any way um in supporting that we, we will do that's brilliant thank you i'll send you links anybody who's interested but they're, they're being creative too okay that's great um I think um, there's, everyone's saying thank you, actually, uh, Sandy. That's what people are saying rather than asking questions. So oh, right. thank you, thank you <laughs> once again.